This is the OGM weekly call on Thursday, May 5th, 2022. Uh, it is Cinco de Mayo, and I actually wanted to start with a poem about Cinco de Mayo, uh, which is pretty interesting. Let's switch over to it here. It's called, quite handily, Cinco de Mayo, and goes as follows. By Luis Rodriguez. Cinco de Mayo celebrates a burning people, those whose land is starved of blood, civilizations which are no longer holders of the night. We reconquer with our feet, with our tongues, that dangerous language, saying more of this world than the volumes of textured and controlled words on a page. We are the gentle rage. Our hands hold the stream of the earth, the flowers of dead cities, the green of butterfly wings. Cinco de Mayo is about the barefoot, the untooled, the warriors of want who took on the greatest army Europe ever mustered and won. I once saw a Mexican man stretched across an upturned sidewalk near Chicago's 18th and Bishop one fifth of May day. He brought up a near empty bottle to the withering sky and yelled out a grito with the words, que viva Cinco de Mayo. And I knew then what it meant, what it meant for barefoot Zapoteca indígenas in the Battle of Puebla, and what it meant for me there on 18th Street among Los Ancianos, the moon-faced children and futureless youth dodging the gunfire and careening battered cars. And it brought me to that war that never ends, the war Cinco de Mayo was a battle of, that I keep fighting, that we keep bleeding for, that war against a servitude that a compa on 18th Street knew all about as he crawled inside a bottle of the meanest Mexican spirits. And here's a link to that poem. Thank you. I was just reading a poem called Cinco de Mayo. Uh, thanks poem. for reminding me about the transcript, Pete. Um, uh, happy Cinco de Mayo. It turns out that the Battle of Puebla didn't actually kick out the French. They then came back and kicked Mexico's butt and took over the country for a few years with Emperor Maximilian, then got kicked out. And I didn't realize that the Battle of Puebla that's being celebrated is that in, 19, in 1861, concurrent with the start of the US Civil War. So the US is in complete trauma while this is happening. And then at the end of the Civil War, we're able to start sending some supplies and some, some aid to, to Mexico so that they can <clears throat> kick the French back out. So the French are finally kicked out. Benito Juarez gets rid of the French in 1867, I think and they have a new republic then. <clears throat> but, but I love the line where this is, uh, where the Battle of Puebla was, was one battle in the, the longer war. And I hadn't thought really about the longer war that we're fighting. Um, welcome to the call, everybody. Um, we have no topic today, but it's a topic week. And there's a lot of interesting topics in the air. So I thought we would just kick the ball around for a moment, do a little tiki-taka verbally if anybody knows what tiki-taka is. Um, everybody who knows what tiki-taka is, raise your hand, please. Pete, it's just you and me. Klaus, you're not a soccer player? Oh, man, okay. So tiki-taka is a method of passing that Barcelona uh, kind of invented with, to, to do ball control, to keep, keep track of the ball. And it's really beautiful. And it's all about triangles, basically. Um, to, to make sure you know where your, your next couple pass partners are. But it's, it's just beautiful. You, if you go on YouTube and, and search for Tiki Taka, you'll find a whole bunch of interesting like soccer plays and stuff like that. So I thought we might pass the ball here. So I'll stop talking and see what anybody has in their heart to talk about today. I'd like to talk about the video that Klaus put in the um, OGM email, because I think it touches on themes like leadership, which are which is also emerging. So it combines a couple of things. I love that idea. Anybody else uh, up for that? Um, that would work for me entirely. How many people have watched the video? Just the trailer. How, uh, how many people have watched the trailer? Okay, so, so enough. And, and, I, and I think also, I think some of us talking about it before other people watched, if they're going to watch it would actually be helpful and useful and interesting. 
And I don't know that it's full of necessarily news, but it's really well done. Stacey, go ahead. I don't think it's more than two minutes. Maybe people want to just watch it now. You mean the trailer? Yeah. Um, do we have a link to the trailer real quick? And shall I screen share the trailer? Is one on my Facebook page? Um, <laughs> How to get it. <laughs> yeah, screen, screen share the trailer. Why don't I screen share the trailer? Yeah. Uh, youth v gov trailer bink 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 um sounds good let me do that and then we'll just spend uh, two minutes and 20 seconds watching the trailer that's a great idea stacy thank you let me go back share screen come here go here and be quiet like you who have come before us in the civil rights movement and other social justice movements it's often the young among us that shine the light on systems of injustice. For a lot of young people right now, life is really scary. Hurricane Matthew hit head on. It was just so terrifying. If this drought gets any worse, our way of life will dissolve. Just as my family's farm is threatened by climate change, so too are the very stability and vitality of our country. The government is taking actions that are directly contributing to the destruction of our planet. We have evidence going back to the 50s that government and the fossil fuel industry knew that if they continued to burn fossil fuels, that it would cause catastrophic impacts. That's when they started editing climate reports. It's all because of choices that we had no participation in. And I'm scared for my future. It's the greatest dereliction of civic responsibility in the history of the Republic. 21 young people ages 11 to 22 are suing the federal government over policies they say are destroying their world. We are not willing to wait around for someone else's timeline to dictate the trajectory of our lives. There we are. Um, I just want to say it's a lot more powerful with the sound and watching it. You know. Oh, sorry, did nobody hear that? The end, all the sound dropped off. Gil, you're muted. Oh, that's weird. I'm sorry. I didn't yeah, see the chat. Yeah, yeah, the second half didn't have any sound. The second half didn't have sound. Crap. The last third or something like that. Last yeah. third. So I'm sorry, I was hearing perfect sound the whole time and I didn't realize it wasn't going through and I wasn't looking at the chat. Um, the, let, me the, put, let me put the link to it over here. So anybody who wants to can go watch. Um, so my apologies about that. And it's on Netflix. So you can, if you have Netflix subscription, you can watch it right now. Um, Pete notes Stacey, that you can watch the trailer there. Sorry, Gil. Can I just ask Stacy a question? Yes, of course. Um, what was it that was particularly compelling to you about this video, given, you know, just lots and lots of stuff out there? What, what's, what, 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 what was powerful for you about this one? It spoke to the helplessness in me. It spoke to, like, that inner child and mm -hmm. it's my emotions, and it made me feel powerful and hopeful. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Yeah. <clears throat> when I was watching the full movie on Netflix, um, yeah, it was it was uh, powerful, and emotional, uh, and I don't know if I was just in a in a flux uh, of emotion at the time. Anyway, I, but uh, my granddaughter, my oldest granddaughter, is going to be twelve years old in twenty thirty. You know, and what what made me think of all the stuff that we're supposed to have done by twenty thirty, when we haven't even started yet, right? And and then you look at 
um, look at all the trend lines. I mean, it is not complicated. You know, when you when you see where we are trending to, and and by 2030 we could have and just an amazing mess. You know, if if we don't capture this, and we are truly running out of time to capture it. So I, that's why uh, I just felt compelled to share that. Um, I agree. Um, anyone else thoughts or feelings about it? Uh, Doug, Doug, you're um, passionate about our not addressing these issues and not coming back to it. I think it's uh, um, this is this is one of those pieces that might actually help tip things. Your thoughts? Well, it's it's still in the paradigm of showing what's wrong and the difficulties, not showing what to do. Uh, I've come to the conclusion that we've got to shift to a command economy. That is, in World War II, the government told General Motors, you've got to stop making cars and start making planes and tanks. It took 90 days and it happened. We need that kind of direction of the economy because the economy cannot get to where we need to be on its own because there are too many interests that are going to get in the way that have to be overcome by a strong central uh, government. Uh, now, the question is how you get there. So uh, several of you have heard my current uh, attempt at a plan. Uh, first, I think we should all be thinking about what to actually do. That is get beyond uh, the complaints about how bad it is. Uh, I think the science view is there's no way we're going to avoid four degrees uh, and up because once we get to four degrees, it keeps going. So the thing is, what could we possibly do to prevent that from happening? So here's my silly plan. We find a way of getting uh, a handful of people at the mid manager level uh, in the key Fortune 100 or Fortune 10 uh, companies to work together across company boundaries. And if you had 15 such people, that is uh, three each from five companies who would say, we've got to have a press conference and announce that we've got to stop economic activity as we're doing it and do something different and uh, demand, uh, not demand, request nicely a meeting with the CEOs of those five companies. And so we've got to shift to a demand economy in order to be able to try and cope with uh, climate change and related issues. So that's my current thinking. Thanks, Doug. Um, Gil, Stacy, Hank. Um, yeah, command economy is a power. Well, two, two things. First of all, um, these kids aren't just complaining about what's wrong. They're bringing suit against the government. It's a bold and very creative move. And for me, the most compelling part of the trailer that I saw without sound was these young people getting sworn in in the witness box to testify. I love that in particular. Um, command economy, sure, but um, you know, we can't even coordinate our way out of a pandemic. Um, you know, and a million people dead in the United States as of yesterday, the WHO doubled the estimates for the globe. Um, command economy requires an ability to command. Uh, we don't have that. We're politically fragmented. Elections matter. We don't get it unless we win elections in a massive degree. Right, so we've got to think about how to get to a command economy. That's the task. Well, we have to, we have to win elections. I mean, no, notable about Roosevelt. Um, um, back in the story that you were telling was not just that he, you know, um, um, you know, commandeered the industrial capacity of the United States, uh, but the other part of the story is that when the union leaders came to him and pounded on the table and said, you need to enact these social protections, blah, 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 he said, great, um, I'm all for you, go out in the streets and make me do it. So politics is a complicated game and we're not playing it well enough. Uh, I think your move, Doug, you know, having CEO leadership is one of the ways to go. But, you know, even the CEO leaders on climate are not putting their lobbying dollars where their mouths are. Uh, climatevoice.org is working on that, trying to organize the workers of the major tech companies to push their leadership to speak out on policy. So, yes, that and many other pieces, um, you know, uh, how do we get to a command economy? Um, in, in this political environment is a very, it, it, it's, it's, it's a tough question. It's a dispiriting question. 
uh, you know, when the when the leak came out on Monday about the SCOTUS decision, I could feel the mood of the country shift in a moment. Polar, you know, some people ecstatic and some people outraged. And, um, you know, maybe this motivates the Democratic base to come out and vote in November and keep us from, you know, political disaster. Maybe not. Um, I don't know. I'll, I'm, I'm, I'm moving into rambles, so I'm going to stop. What do other people think? Uh, Stacy, hey. Okay. Command economy, yes. Doug's plan on one side, but man can come from the government unless the people rise up. And that's where I see it has to be the populace that are calling for these things, and it has to be without the labels, because the way they keep the populace divided is socialism, Marxism, this, that. The populace can respond to their children. When I went to the uh, the anti-gun violence march. It was all organized by kids, but what was different is that their parents were all supporting them and they had people on all different political sides of the aisle. So I think these plans have to work together, but we have to include the regular people and we have to motivate them. And that's what excited me about that trailer because it's a way to educate and mobilize. Thanks, Stacey. Um, Hank, Pete, then me. Yeah, uh, there's a lot to say about this. <clears throat> so yeah, exactly. Uh, it's it's terrific because it is actually doing something. It's doing something with the generation that's required to do something because it's their future <clears throat> so in the United States government. And if there were 50 or 100 or 1,000 sets of children sue in the United States government, you wouldn't need a command economy. Uh, people would be out on the streets demanding this. That's one point. Uh, the second point is uh, Doug's uh, proposition, <clears throat> the 15 CEOs. Well, there's something to be said for that. And I'm, I'm not sure I've said it in this context, though I have said it in other OGM uh, calls. I've been working for the past half year trying to figure out a concept which I call the 200. So it's not 15 people, but there are probably 200 people with their hands on the levers and on the switches who control what people think and what people think and what people, how people behave. And I think we all know them. And if we made an exercise of it in the next 20 minutes, we could probably get 150 of the 200 names. And it doesn't matter if they're actually 200 or 300. We all know that there are people on, uh, uh, CEOs on interlocking directorships. There are politicians, there are religious leaders. There are so-called uh, Instagram and TikTok influencers. How do you reach those people? So I always ask people, yeah, you want to change the world. Where is the lever and where is the fulcrum? And I think that the fulcrum has a lot to do with children and grandchildren. And I think the lever has a lot to do with a new narrative. And the new narrative has a lot to do with positivity and about the psychology of behavior of 200 people whose names we know. And I'll be happy to have another call about that sometime because I need more ideas to fill that out. So I don't know what you think about that, but that's what I would say. Uh, Hank, thank you. That's, that's, that helped spark a bunch of, make a lot of connections in my head as well. Um, Pete? Uh, thanks. I, I don't know how to say this without without making it sound like belly aching or, or worse. Um, but there's, there's something odd. <laughs> there's something odd about uh, Doug kind of calmly and rationally saying, uh, okay, we have folks we have here an existential crisis. You know, the world is, you know, as you know, it is going to end in, in a short time. And then where we get to is, well, but we can't make the politics work. When we follow the rules of the game, you know, it, it, or, or we, we can't be energized to follow the rules of the game, or there's people who are following the rules of the game and not doing anything. And then there's other people not following the rules of the game and, and turking the system all around, right? I don't know how we get ourselves out of that, but 
but saying we can't make the politics work, you know, when we follow the rules doesn't mean that the existential crisis isn't going to crush us, right? <laughs> it means that we have to start not playing by the rules. I don't know. Um, uh, Klaus, then me, then John. Yeah, <clears throat> I have a meeting this afternoon with a group of retired uh, engineers, mostly, but senior level people from the US arms industry, uh, chemical engineers, mostly, <clears throat> and they have been um, I've been in touch on and off with them for more than a year. Um, and they're really very passionate and excited about the urgency of the moment and they want to really engage. And my uh, point was, uh, how, do you, how do you focus on your expertise without connecting across the island with everyone else? Uh, and I played Deming, uh, you know, the risk or the, the, the uh, damage of subordinating, of subordination within a system. And because that's what seems to happen is everybody's running uh, in within their field of expertise without connecting across to, uh, to look at what this all means. So that so we'll have you know, a conversation about this afternoon. And the way I want to frame that conversation is to, to bring back what Jerry already mentioned the time when the Ford Motor Company uh, shifted from producing cars to rolling tanks of the assembly line within six months. Think about how that could have possibly happened, right? In today's world, it would take more than six months to just develop the blueprints on how to change that factory, right? Uh, I mean, it's a, it's a significant undertaking to change uh, the, the entire machine lineup, you know, to figure out the supply chain you need to develop, uh, the different expertise you need to bring to bear. It's an incredible, uh, a complex undertaking. So how did this happen? It happened because everybody had the same thing in mind. We need to produce tanks and airplanes uh, and, and, and artillery. So we need to produce weapon systems. And everyone in the field in that, in that uh, factory down to the engineer and the mechanic knew what had to be done and they were working towards that so there is a complementarity within these different skill sets that were motivated by a common idea you know by by a, a, a shared mindset and that in turn was precipitated by Pearl Harbor so there was a Pearl Harbor type event that shocked everybody down to the bone of uh, no, this is an existential risk we are we are exposed to here. We have to defend the nation. That's how the Ukrainians are fighting right now. You know, they're pulling together because it's an existential crisis, and there is no option other than to collaborate with each other and to help each other and to support each other. So it's a completely trust-based system. You know, I have a conversation with this engineer. I'm telling him I need you know, these types of screws. I need this type of, of, uh, uh, of tool, what have you, and it's happening. And so we, 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 we have been talking in the, in the uh, uh, climate space here uh, about needing a, 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 the equivalency of a Pearl Harbor type event. Of course, the problem is in climate change, once that event happens, we're, we're toast, right? I mean, you can't, uh, you know, for, for this kind of calamity to occur means that we have, we have crashed through tipping points that are completely irreversible. And I've, I'm afraid we're already there. So I've been at this for 10 years. You know, I mean, you all know, I've been trying to galvanize uh, opinions to, create a common understanding of the threat we face what are the key leverage points in the system you know that we need to, that we need to pull on where where there is the most power and in my mind it's community based decentralized food systems as a first step because that will provide calm right i mean the the moment the food supply gets challenged all bets are off which is what we're seeing right now i mean this is this year this year we will see food shortages in North Africa and the Middle East that will create millions of dislocations. It's, I mean, it's completely baked into the system. It's inevitable. You know, they can't get the crop into the ground in the Ukraine 
you have scorching heat in Pakistan and India that is burning or has already burned half of their crop for this year. So we are already there, but the, it is simply not visible uh, to, to, and, and the, 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 the tragedy is you know, that our, this propaganda network that we are exposed to, this, this mass media, refuses to, to, to accept. I mean, this don't look up phenomena is truly there. You know, it's just absolutely refuse to accept you know, that this, is, this situation uh, is, is, is facing us. We're here, we're at it. And to get, the, and there is, you know, when you, like my wife doesn't want to hear, hear me anymore, right? Because don't stop talking. I can't take it. I can't handle it because she understands what it is but she also feels completely powerless to do anything about it. So it's just creating enormous frustration. You know? And so people don't want to hear you anymore. They don't want to, you know, it's just all too much and so on. So, I mean, it is, it is uh, painful. It is, it is a, it's a crazy time. It is a crazy time. It is a very crazy time. Um, I've got a couple of things I want to put in the, in the conversation then, then, then over to you, John, uh, and I, here are my notes. So one thing is, I think we can all imagine that since everybody's sending javelin missiles and everything and tanks and everything to Ukraine, that the armories are being refilled pretty quickly. There's like, I think that 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 system probably is working just fine. Thank you very much. And they're going into overdrive because woo, we get to spend all the ammo we've been building up for all these years and look at the budgets and so forth. And that's not an issue and hardly even a conversation. Um, I have to say that uh, I love the clarity of the documentary. It was really crisp and clear for me. I was just like, wow, okay, here are the harms. Here are the kids. This is they're, they're, They had nothing to do with it. Like, like the argument was presented really well. And I, find, I found that it seized my throat multiple times. I cried a bunch watching the documentary. Um, and partly, Partly I have a weakness for people doing kind of altruistic things that are maybe unexpected. And this was not so unexpected. This is kind of planned. But, but um, th these moments, I, I thought that the, this particular documentary did a very lovely job of bringing us to those moments of, of pain and, and passion and, and worry and fear and all that uh, in, a, in a really productive way. And it, it, it goes through it very nicely. Um, then um, this command economies thing is really interesting. Uh, Doug, I, I, my, the sensei, the senior sensei at my Aikido dojo is a anarcho-capitalist who loves Mises and uh, like Hayek's book, The Road to Serfdom is all about avoiding central control, all about, there, there's a whole bunch of people, at least in this country and across the earth, who fear centralized control. Then in China and the Soviet Union, for good reason, Mao and Stalin are arguably the people who've killed the most people on earth ever, um, and not in wars, in, through, through, through stupid ass policies and moving the kulaks off the land, which causes the Holodomor in, uh, in Ukraine, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there's this vast and justifiable fear of central command, uh, command and control. I want to pause it, Doug. How do we get the equivalent of a command economy? How do we get the effect of a command economy from some completely different route, maybe from some decentralized resonant set of movements? Because part of the problem with climate change is that how to fix it. Do we put Dyson spheres up or aerosols in the atmosphere to increase the albedo? How do, do we like do, drop iron filings in the ocean to try to change like, wait, which of these? And, and Klaus has found one thing which makes complete and utter sense to me, which is, hey, people, if we worry about soil fertility and carbon sequestration and making good food and changing to, you know, changing away from a destructive economy into, into another one, that could be a really good thing. Um, love that. And, and I'm, 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 Klaus, I'm completely on board and want to do more of that and try to help figure out. And, and I love, I think it was Hank who said, where's the lever and where's the fulcrum? which is really important. And then also that children and grandchildren might be the angle here. And one of the things that really hit me about this documentary was uh, Levi in particular, who is brilliant. The young kid with the shock of hair um, shows up throughout the documentary and is completely centered and wonderful and um, great in front of a crowd. Um, and and I think one of the great unused links in society is the link between grandparents and their grandkids. 
And there's a possibility here that there's a lever action between very young people and their, their two generations up to try to form these bonds and these resonances to go to things together, to basically pull things together. Uh, now I have a thought in my brain called, um, does 2020 mark a generational tipping point? And it's got, a, as you can see, it's pretty busy, uh, but I've got connected to it, Greta Thunberg and the school strikes for climate change. It's right here. Uh, uh, Buttigieg for president, uh, the AOC and the squad, um, basically all of us, uh, the, the, the Marjorie Stoneham Douglas school kids against guns who are not getting much traction on gun control, uh, the Sunrise Movement, uh, Nerd Fighteria, Hank and John Green, Generation Z, et cetera, et cetera. And I have a funny feeling that digital natives understanding how to use the medium, finding the right lever and getting a lot of help from allies who are a wee bit older, like maybe us, uh, might be able to do a lot. And I mean a lot because they might be able to wrap their arms around the politics that are screwing up the, the, the whole, we're in lockup because politics is in a Mexican standoff because a bunch of people have figured out how to weaponize mistrust and keep us in a stalemate. And stalemate helps them. Stalemate just helps them all. Um, and we need to find some way to clear out of the stalemate. Um, and so, so I'm trying to figure out how do we, um, I, I'm really interested in decentralized movements that aim in the same direction. How do we get a collimation of goals and energies across a series of movements that create effectively the same thing, Doug, that you're looking for from, we just need to put someone in charge to tell everybody, frickin' close your factory now and start making this other thing. Because that I don't, I don't see how that happens. I think that that's a, a general threat to sort of everybody and too easily co-opted, uh, you know, Imagine, imagine Republicans come into the majority and Trump gets reelected and he's got, he, his, his, his hands go on the steering wheel of a command economy. I don't think, I don't think any of us wants that. Um, so, so how do we get that equivalent? Um, with that, I will, I will stop and turn it over to John. <laughs> yes. Okay. Uh, I'm just laughing because, you know, well, I think we all can sense both the immensity and complexity of of what's pushing in on us and also how we're serving each other i i really appreciate uh all of you and and many comments uh in, in the ones you've just made jerry and and pete and and doug so i don't have a solution start <laughs> what i have are a couple of pieces that could be redesigned into something possibly that would be a solution so i'm going to just couple of elements. Um, one element would be uh, the search for memes. Uh, sounds like what? Yeah. But I mean, you know, those of us who've looked at this, Doug, we're, we're in other conversations, we're in serious conversations. And, and Doug is often, you know, says, uh, okay, guys, listen, <laughs> you know, you're, you're talking about this solution, but it you haven't done the math, you haven't done the homework, it doesn't really fix it. And in, in part of that conversation is, is to talk about carbon negative instead of carbon neutral, because carbon negative, you know, carbon neutral, all kinds of funny games you can play with, with things that are not neutral. But if you say carbon negative, it's a bit harder to fake carbon negative. So that, I'm not saying that the meme should be carbon negative. I'm just using that as an example of the criteria to apply. Here's another different idea, dashboard. Um, but I'm not thinking dashboard, you know, if, if I was going to have a dashboard for this, it would have at least two areas where you, what you'd be watching is something positive that's happening, like, like this documentary, and you'd have, a, and, it would, and it'd be layered. So you have the immediate thing, and then you click on it, and then it gets a little, give you the two minute version, and then it gives you the 20 minute version, you know, and so on. So it's, it's, it's depth, it's got depth, and eventually winds up somewhere like Jerry's brain. Um, but also two scary negatives you know this is this is not good <laughs> this one's going on this this is really bad you know uh uh the people who are both bad as in this is somebody doing a bad thing and also these are people suffering because of the bad things that we have done now already that's a pretty complicated idea dashboard positive negative carbon negative and it's not enough it's it's not it's you no know, it doesn't it doesn't ring it doesn't 
it doesn't pull together all the things we want to pull together, but uh, I'm just offering it as a, you know, start there and keep going, keep going. I, I think, I think uh, a, a, a central place where people could click and see, and it would have a short summary and then a longer summary and then a deeper summary. And, and, and Jerry's brain is just one, it's a good example, but we could have multiple deep uh, backups to to explain things and some kind of attention to the uh, cultural memes and cultural themes that are going on. Um, and then and there's more, there's something I'm, there's a bunch of things I haven't thought of <laughs> that, that need to be woven into this idea, I think before it would begin to have any kind of traction. So keep going. <laughs> Thanks, John. And uh, Mark Trexler is not on this call, but he's on the Monday calls a bunch and has an entire brain enabled thing that's all about climate change and all about dashboards of different kinds. And he's he's he and Pete are experimenting with alternate user interfaces to it. So it doesn't look like a brain. So it looks like something else, et cetera, et cetera. I think that's a really good avenue uh, to pursue. Um, thanks, John. Uh, Carl, and welcome to the call. Thank you. Carl is a very long time brain user, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. I met Harlan at a conference in December of 1998. So it's had a love hate relationship with it for about three years. Um, and um, yeah, the, the one breakthrough I that, um, was putting date using um, date like um, year, month, um, day. So chronological is the same as alphabetical. And that <laughs> let me take it to a whole nother level and then um, finding getting things done uh, method there of David Allen that's so it's the, like Doug Engelbart talks about this co-evolution of human and tool systems. So getting things done in the brain is a core part of my um, system. Um, I put a link, let's see, did I hit yes? Yeah. Um, I put a link to Ray Anderson's um, TED talk from years ago. That's one of, it's really important. Uh, he um, found an interface carpet and it, anywhere you go, basically any hotel, any um, government building, it's, you'll see the square carpet tiles and they've been, um, they created a whole new um, mechanism like carpet as a service you, it wears out, they come take it, they feed it back into their system. They pulled old carpet out of landfills. I mean, they really, um, uh, and that TED talk he has in there, you can't hold people accountable if you don't provide an alternative. That's one of the key points I think he makes in there. And then the other thing too, is you hear all this talk about seven generations, but people, it's like most of the time it's like, you can just tell people are thinking like, oh, seven generations from now. But I mean, we've got the, the living generations now. We've got, if you want to just do 18 year um, type of things, we'll have generation beta are the, are the children that will be born January 1st, uh, 2036 and beyond. So what are we doing to make the world for them and stuff? And Ray Anderson also, there's a tomorrow's, Anything you see from him, you'll see he recites a poem, Tomorrow's ch um, ch um, Child and stuff about, uh, about exactly that. So the seven generations from like my father's generation, you know, type of thing, or my grandfather's generation, as you were talking about earlier. So I'll leave it at that for now. Thanks, Carl. Uh, Doug. Okay, one of the things that keeps coming up is strategies of uh, populist uh, revolt, which tends to divide society into us versus them. And the them, I'm going to propose that there's a whole resource that we're not paying attention to. And my uh, plan for the 15 starts with middle level managers who are below the radar, who actually think much more like us than we tend to want to think. Uh, they're discouraged about what's happening. They're scared for their kids, all that. Uh, I think that we want a movement that energizes those people and pulls them in from the power position that they actually already have. 
they are in the organizations. Uh, if they work together, starting below the radar so they don't get squashed, uh, and build enough strength to be able to uh, have a good press conference, uh, go to the CEO, not to get turn the effort over to the CEO, but to include the CEO in the effort of the group that's emerging. Uh, but the key point I want to make here is that uh, we tend to, to create an us versus them dialogue around climate change, and it just won't work. Uh, the political analysis, I think that a historian would do, would say that the, uh, the managerial class is a huge part of America, uh, of the world, actually, that's being ignored. Um, Doug, I like that a lot. And I think there's inexpensive and interesting ways to get those people together, to have interesting conversations, to give them resources, a whole bunch of things. And I'm not clear that anybody is particularly addressing that or them. I think that there's a there's a nice opening there to do that. Uh, Gil, it sounds like you've seen something like that. You're muted. Yeah, that's what I've been doing for the last thirty years, Jerry. Uh, and not just me, but you know, dozens, you know, dozens, if not hundreds, of people have been working, advising, working with those middle managers, recruiting them, generating them. There's an organization called Net Impact, which is a national or maybe international organization of MBA students who are the ones who are moving into those positions and bringing these ideas with them. There are, you know, there are so many conferences that you can exhaust yourself going to the conferences about this, providing mutual support, resources, consulting support, tools, and so forth. So Doug, it's a great idea. It's underway. It has had enormous results. If you just look at the conversations in the business world now compared to where they were 20 years ago, there is a significant shift that has happened at middle management level, CEO level, board level. Um, companies that had one or two sustainability people are, are now expanding those departments to 10, 15, 20. There's a mad rush for talent. Companies are hungry for middle managers who know this stuff. There's not enough of them being minted. Uh, <clears throat> corporate boards are recruiting board members to have deep sustainability knowledge. Um, something like a quarter to a third of the investment in the public markets has to move to some sort of some nod in the direction of this these issues it's pretty superficial and got a lot of bullshit layered into it uh, so there's enormous momentum in exactly the direction that you're talking about Doug, and it's good and it has borne fruit and we've got you know most of the major companies in the world now have significant climate goals unfortunately almost none of them are fulfilling the goals Almost none of them have plans to even fulfill the goals, don't know what to do. Uh, so lots of momentum and utterly inadequate, utterly inadequate to where we are and what we need to do. Thanks, Gil. Um, Wendy. Sorry to bring up. And you're muted. Okay. I'm gonna share my screen. Um, because I feel like this is something that I've been working on. Um, it comes from a lot of different sources, but I'm putting my own words to it so far. Um, and really, I just wanna point out that um, this is for me like a cycle of evolution or a cycle of emergence or a cycle of creation or a cycle of innovation. I'm trying to kind of codify a, a common theme, the common themes here. And one of the things that I've been talking about with some people who are helping me out with this, it, and that relates to this conversation, I think, is a lot of, I, I feel like a lot of leaders exist in the final couple stages, right? When something is less risky, we kind of already see what it is. We already know what it is. We're, it's about to be a major contribution in the world. Um, and maybe we're at implementation stage um, and they go, oh yeah, this is a great new thing. And they bring it into contribution stage or they help. I don't feel like our leaders are in a place anymore where they can feel safe um, bringing something up that's brand new or ideating on something. And also this whole section, the early stages uh, require a tremendous amount of time, a tremendous amount of, of variety of input. So when we're talking about different silos and things, right, each discipline or each silo of understanding kind of has its own cycle. And we're also saying that, yeah, we need, but we need one group, we need one whole cycle, we need points at which the documentation or, or the output or the harvesting from one uh, discipline can be shared with another discipline and become an inception stage for another discipline to then take it and move, move their piece, right? And this needs to be 
be able to be interwoven at different times. So I don't think I'm saying anything new here that we don't already know. I just kind of wanted to put this framing on it because I'm not sure we talk about it in this way very often. Um, and I think it's super important to recognize that we have all the solutions, right? And I think that's what I hear, I'm hear. i hearing other people say too. Gil, you've been working on it forever. Other people have been thinking about it from all these different sides. Why isn't it being coordinated? And my, you know, my contribution to that why is I'm not sure we're asking the right questions. And I do believe it's bottom up. And I think recognizing what stages things are in and what types of people we need in order to shepherd something from one stage to another is starting to be a, a critical component to the conversation because it's what will galvanize and help coordinate all the efforts with each other. So to that end, I'm, you know, I, I kind of end up wanting to say to Klaus and to um, and to Gil and other people who are working in, in these spheres, Mark Tressler, if, if we're trying to kind of solve one focus or where we're feeling like there's movement towards a, a larger growing movement, um, how can something like the Meta Project or OGM help bring all its members around, say, for a month, we everyone's efforts focus towards Klaus or focus towards the people who are already focused on, right? What role can we play, right? If I'm a person who weaves and maps, how can I do that in service to climate change right now for the next month or whatever, right? How can we create that list of 200 people? I think all the answers are important that we've come up with. How can we turn all of that effort towards one particular experiment, one particular focus for a while? I thought, Klaus, I was listening to you last week talk about the things that you need as you as you um, presented your project and it stuck with me. And I wanna go back to what you had said last week about where the project is at and what it needs. I feel like there's, it, it, it spoke to me and it's been reverberating for the last week. And I've shared, you know, I've shared my interest in maybe focusing on climate change as as all of Meta Project, right? Whatever's emerging from there using climate change, your efforts, planetary care, forest to, to be a focus. It's just an idea. But I think if we don't start picking some of these things and saying, hey, I'm not quite sure what my contribution can be, but when I make a contribution, it's gonna be in this direction, um, then it will draw all the different disciplines hopefully together and we can at least start practicing, even if we're a little messy at it, we can start practicing on a larger scale how to solve some of these things in collaborative nature. Thanks. Thanks, Wendy. I just wanna pause our conversation for a second because that was a lot and it was really useful and my brain is like spinning. Um, so let's go into silence for a moment and then uh, come back into our conversation. Thank you. Stacy, did you want to jump jump in? Yes, um, I just wanted to say yes, yes, and yes, um, <laughs> and also what. So I want to speak to the populist thing and the idea that it can't work because we get divided, because that also ties in with the grandchildren and the children in the sense that we get divided. That's on us as individuals, and many of us are learning to not do that. And that's where leadership comes in, being able to talk to people with different ideas. With grandchildren and children, two things are happening. They're both looking at the parent, and they're both able to see sides of the parent, and they can interact in a way. I mean, there's more unconditional love, and that's what we're learning to do with we need to be learning to do with people that don't really agree with us. So like right now, I've been uh, talking on about abortion and I've been trying to reach out to the libertarians and reframe it. Not that I could do this on my own, but just in the groups. And I'm trying to just spread the idea about, this is not about women, 
This is about individual rights versus state rights and get them to see, because the more they talk, the more they see their inconsistency. So I just want to talk about you. So I'm trying to highlight Wendy's asking the right questions and reframing. That's really important. Um, and I just want to repeat again how when people were supporting their children at the rallies against gun violence, they put all their political feelings aside because one motivating factor for people that works all the time is their children. People will go to the ends of the earth for their children. So my feeling is for a populist movement, children really have to lead. And how we frame the questions can help mitigate the divide. Oh, and the last thing I wanna say is that every story, where a story, every story has to have a threat. That's part of a storyline, that's a pattern. That's systems thinking too. Um, I, I wanna go back to Wendy for a second before going to you, Doug, um, partly because a, a piece of the birth narrative for me of OGM is that on the one hand, it would be great if we composted and had a logical sequence and showed the arguments and had a dashboard, uh, uh, as John was saying earlier, and a, a series of things like that. And on the other hand, a lot of the conflict here is because uh, some parties in this conflict of ideas are just working on leaps of faith. And, and it, it has little to do with contradictions or anything else. In fact, some of the contradictions are okay. They're sort of intentional or they've been reframed as, hey, you know, that, that just happens. It's uh, Trump is God's flawed messenger, is perfect. It's just perfect. Ignore the fact that this guy's had, you know, these that he that he has no ethics that he's had this horrible life uh god's god's work is done in strange ways and sometimes the person who gets you the most judges on the supreme court so that you get results is a freaking lunatic and an asshole and live with it and and that that's a reasonable strategic position to take unfortunately that that is not that is not a completely loony position to take if all you want is that political outcome um, and so, and so I'm torn a lot, and I think of this as a polarities to manage, not as irreconcilable differences between the, hey, if a grandchild sat down and worked through the logic, I, I'm sitting here thinking about families in Ukraine calling their families in Russia and saying, hey, we are actually being killed here on the ground, and their families in Russia saying, no, you're not, this is just a plot. And, and to what level do they need to walk out on the street and show the empty house of the neighbor who got who died because a shell landed in their house, or what, I don't know what it is, but at some point that resistance might melt and, and might be something else. But there's a there's an act of faith, there's a mental act that that shuts down logic and sensibility at some point, and and, and intentionally keeps it at arm's length, very successfully, often for too long until things are just devastating. And we need to. I think one of one of the goals maybe here is how to melt that, how to how to get through. Um, how, to, how to love irrational leaps of faith unconditionally in the way that Stacey was just describing in a way that lets us have a different conversation and come to some different conclusions. And I, I'm, this clearly, I'm not sure anybody's solved this, although there's lots of progress on things like trauma and collective trauma and so forth. I'm, you know, I have a big collection of people who are doing very successful work on individual and social trauma that didn't exist 20 years ago. I mean, there were a few pioneers 20 years ago, but now it's, it's like much more mainstream. It's in the air, it's happening. And that, that's one key linchpin for all of this is like people are just suffering a whole bunch of trauma now more than ever. Sorry, lots of different uh, digressions there, but I think, I think this is all of a, of a piece. Uh, Doug and Wendy. I think that uh, most of the organizations that I'm aware of that are uh, consistent with Gill's list are still in the realm of profit making, uh, looking at how to green, how to look, use new technologies or whatever to have a position uh, in the existing economy. I think we need a version of tough love that goes further. Uh, we've got to use the wealth that we have to spend it down in order to cope with what climate change is gonna demand of us. Uh, I think that, um, 
I want to give an example, uh, a clearly a thing that's going to be for the future important is food. And what I think we need to do is have land reform in order to grow more food. So if there was a, uh, I'm going to segue here into a footnote. Um, the Greek historian Polybius says that the form of government should match the existential crisis society is facing. So for example, if the issue is distribution of wealth, democracy is pretty good at creating the conversation to work that issue out. But if the society is threatened by something from the outside, democracy is the worst thing to do because you get divisive uh, uh, interest parties and can't come to a, co a coherent strategy. So uh, autocracy in some form becomes appropriate when the threat is external. Democracy is appropriate when the threat is internal divisions. Uh, the idea that the form of government should match the pro problem is a very interesting one and it's been affecting my thinking lately. And that, that in order to cope with a demand economy, it cannot be done without a centralized strong government that can mobilize across the hierarchies, including the lowest levels, uh, based on the idea that, look, we're facing an existential crisis. We've got to spend our wealth to cope with it uh, rather than trying to increase our wealth. Uh, end of comment. Thanks, Doug. And then wealth has a lot to do with it here. Policies have a tremendous amount to do with it. And you're talking about land reform and so forth. Um, Wendy. Yeah, Doug, um, I, I agree with everything you're saying. And I think in my lifetime, I haven't seen enough of that happen on the things that matter most to me, right? So, so it's interesting to me, I, I find myself when you're making comments going, yeah, 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 that's all right. And I, I feel like it's an and, right? And, and we also need a bunch of movement bottom up um, in ways that, break, I break through in ways that um, create, create the systemic change that we need. I, I just don't think the systemic change is going to come from the top down. Um, and I think that that's, if we're waiting for that to happen, I do believe it will happen over time. No question. I think the issue is we don't have that time. We don't have the time that it takes for things to happen more slowly and more gracefully. Um, and I'm not seeing any structures that's going to bring together the leaders um, in a way that will create the kind of change that we need in the time frame that we need. Um, so I keep looking to um, how to how to um, yeah how to coordinate. So 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 let me just add two two things back into what I was saying before. One is when I when I mean we all focus on one thing, I mean we're we're still we're still almost representing or take bring coming from our area of expertise but let's say governance is figuring out how to orient itself for the benefit specifically of improving things like regenerative agriculture or climate change because it needs that um, new forms of economics are specifically looking at how can we help take things like regenerative economics and climate change forward one more step media right is looking at that um, education is looking at that, right? What forms of education do we have that will galvanize? And right, this documentary is one form of education. The week is one form of education. So I just feel like, I, you know, right? I'm trying to say, how do we get everyone from their areas and from their disciplines kind of working on one thing for a while? Um, and I had something else I wanted to say. Hold on one sec. Hmm. Yeah, it was something new, but I lost it. So I'll come back. It'll come back. Thanks, Wendy. Uh, Doug, did you, are you, is your hand up from before? Or did you want to jump back in? Uh, you're muted. To complete the agriculture example I was using in land reform, I would like it that any land which is not growing vegetables could be appropriated by anybody who would undertake to grow vegetables, food uh, on that land. Uh, 
that would take a very strong central government that would have to declare all contracts of land ownership as they currently exist void for the duration of the project. Uh, but that's the kind of strong effort that I think we need that we can't possibly get with the populist movement alone. Obviously, you want to integrate across. Uh, I mean, Plato talked about the one, the few, and the many. Uh, they should be uh, how to bring them together into a common project. And I think the middle level managers are a resource to that, and we don't have any other. So a couple things off what you just said, Doug. Um, one of my favorite TED Talks is Pam Warhurst's How We Can Eat Our Landscapes. She talks about her, the town of Todd Morden in the UK where she lives, which is right outside Manchester, and how years ago they went and they turned every plot of land into food. They, they, they called the police station and said, you have rose bushes outside. Do you mind if we plant lemon trees? And they were like, sure, cool, come on in. And it's become a tourist destination. It created community. It did a whole bunch of really interesting things. I have no idea if the town still looks that way or what, what, you know, what's happened to it. And, and I don't know about the contagion effect of that, but, and maybe I'll just go to full uh, screen share for a second here so that it's not so tiny on mine. So here's Pam Warhurst and how we can eat our landscapes, the town of Todd Morden, foodscaping, edible landscapes and so forth. Um, and I have this TED talk under one of my other favorite thoughts in my brain, which is revitalizing cities. And this is where I collect up stories of all different kinds of cities that did very cool stuff that created, uh, so it's Ciclovias in Bogota, uh, under Enrique Peñalosa, the mayor at the time, uh, and you know, a, a bunch of other sort of stuff. But, but this, is a, this is a collection of stories to tell of how you and your neighbors could go do something to be really interesting for your town. It's not focused on farming or food, and there could be a subset of it that are, because there's so many different ways to do this. There's a gorilla, there's a, what are they called? Plant bombs, food bombs? Uh, there's a, shoot, types of bomb. I think I've got it under here. Jerry, Ike Ikea is now starting to offer plant bombs. Fabulous. That's fabulous. Boy, how did I not have plant bombs in here? These are all actual bombs. Too bad. Um, so, so I think there's, there's, an ex there's a way to do this in a fun, excited, together way. And people like to join things that are connective. They like to join things that bring their town together. They like to do, you know, and, and, and um, I think I've told this story once before, but I went to a thing called Opportunity Collaboration, which was like a dating game for funders and though, you know, nonprofit seeking funding. And I found one little nonprofit there called Choice Humanitarian or something like that. And their MO was to go into a village, let's say in Guatemala and say, what do you need? They didn't come in and say, hey, we build like wells and we're gonna make you a well. Got a well, we got funding, let's make a well. They came in and said, what do you need? And one town said, we need a, a, a soccer field. And, and they were like, don't you need a hospital or a school? And they're like, no, we need a soccer field. We need to get our kids off the street. And they built a soccer field and it had some of those some of those desired results, but they were busy following and being of help. And part of our problem here is, and this is the problem with the command economy also, is that it runs against anybody's, many people's natural inclinations to do stuff. They have to, everybody needs to find their way to do the thing that they feel drawn to do with people they want to do it with in a way that they think is going to help their life. Whatever that, whatever that picture or frame looks like. And we can maybe influence the picture or frame. Certainly, the, 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 the cultures and religions that we're raised in paint that frame, like uh, redemption in heaven. So you should do these sorts of things as, you know, as your act says you are alive because that's what God decrees, uh, which is then changed by the prosperity gospel that says, oh, and by the way, getting really wealthy is a sign of being blessed by God. And that's a good thing, as opposed to a couple of years before prosperity gospel where that the greedy and the rich are the ones who won't pass through the eye of the needle if I'm misquoting the Bible properly. Um, so so, so the, the stories that we tell, the big stories that are told outside control a lot of these possibilities. And we're stuck inside of a series of dysfunctional stories. We're stuck inside of a series of dysfunctional systems, all of which are hard to tip, which took me back to land reform, Doug, 
which I wanted to sort of bring up a bit because I want to I want to just ask a little bit what do you mean by land reform and what would be the shape of land reform because I grew up partly in Peru and reforma agraria land reform was like what half the parties that lost most of the time were running on and every now and then they would win and redistribute the big landowners farms into small plots and so forth and then it would get taken back you know back and forth is this struggle over the joystick over time um, uh, then there's the Georgist sort of land use tax, which is really interesting, but I don't know how we get there. And then uh, the thing I wish we could impose is a soil fertility tax, which, uh, you know, if, if you are depleting the soil, then we're going to tax the hell out of you. And if you're making healthier soil, we're going to make it, you know, like, like give you subsidies. That'd be cool. But Doug, where, where in, what do you mean by land reform? Well, I mean, uh, doing what's necessary to take the land that we have and use it for growing uh, because it's going to be a need. We're going to be losing a lot of land to temperatures that make growing food impossible. So any place that could grow food. So I, I picture, and this, of course, is a little abstract, but I'm doing the best I can, that anybody who can find a piece of land that's fallow or, or in some kind of use like parking lots that's not growing food, they have the right to requisition it, providing they grow food on it. Uh, and nobody can take land away from somebody else if it's growing food. Uh, and I realize there's a, a difference in growing food between local efforts and uh, corporate growing that we probably don't want to have too much of. But, um, you know, it's got to start with the intent that we're in real trouble and we need draconian measures that are going to be really painful uh, because it's going to affect interests uh, and stability in people's lives for sure. But climate change is going to do that anyway. So let's find the best way to do it. Yeah. Uh, my own view is that you start with things that are really attractive to do. Like if you think of gardens and habitat as being in the same place, so you walk out your front door and there's food that you're growing. It's safe for children. It's safe for pets. It's safe for old people. Uh, it's attractive. Uh, we want to think of putting food and habitat together in a culture of, uh, of craftsmanship and attractiveness that makes it a project that feels like it's worth doing. Uh, end of rant. <laughs> Thanks, Zag. Agree. Um, Wendy. Yeah, so I remembered um, what I was going to say. I'm, I'm turning back a bit <laughs> to the um, thread that was weaving itself before about um, concerns, uh, valid concerns that I want to re-echo here that um, around people who are dissenting or people who don't understand or people who aren't on board or people who don't think like us and finding ways to find common ground, bring people together, galvanize uh, momentum. However, I also want to point out that there is a tremendous amount of available motivation and um, resources and information. And I think a ton of low hanging fruit, I think the bottleneck is in the coordination. Um, I do think we do need to solve those issues of, of, of contention and division and duality and, and those things. But I, I think we can do a lot of really good stuff long before we hit that edge. And hopefully by the time we hit that edge, we'll have some better solutions. As, as, as we all know, there are people working on that piece as well. It just seems to me that with some coordination, we could do a lot before we ever hit that edge. Thanks. Thanks, Wendy. Klaus? Yeah, I mean, it all comes back down to having a shared perception of reality, you know, of, of having a shared understanding of um, what, what are the issues that need to be tackled and, 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 uh, and approached? And this idea of, of coordination that Mandy just mentioned is really elusive. Um, I mean, I've been working in a leadership role with the Sierra Club at the Grassroots Network. And to just get people to, to come to a common platform of, of accepting the science, you know, the, the, 
what we know about raising food and what the food system is all about is, is an amazing battle. Um, and, but, but is that a prerequisite to taking actions that might remedy food scarcity and soil depletion? I mean, do they need do, do we all do they all need to agree? Or if they took some actions while disagreeing, but the actions were good, we'd be cool. So I, I'm saying, does this have to be a sequence or can we just like maybe skip the theory and just go straight to let's all do these things together? Yeah, it needs scale, you know. So when you when you think about the food system, when you have, you know, like here we can we can grow our own tomatoes in Bend, but we are the the local Walmart imports tomatoes from Mexico at a price that you can't match, you know. And so and they they have, have absolutely no provision to to uh, purchase local produce and put it on the shelf. So the system is so disrupted, you know. Um, that there has to be a certain level of uh, acceptance and understanding so that the supply chain starts collaborating. And this is actually my focus now. I mean, it took me six months, you know, to get into funding, to, to, to talk about funding the transition. And, and we have actually made some really good progress there because the concept that has penetrated out of this last serious uh, of discussions in the last webinar was the aggregation of support. You know, they're calling it now planted okay. capital um, so that you get support from multiple sources to have a farmer change and not just uh, focused on soil and crop, but focused on pollinator protection, water shed repair and things like that. So that was good. But my focus now really is on supply chain. You know finding collaboration within the supply chain to support farmers, even very, very small scale farmers. Because last year, you know, I, I just keep listening in. Here's a farmer who has a bumper crop of tomatoes and he ends up having, having to plow them under because there's no market for it. All he can do is give it away for free to the food bank and get a tax credit that doesn't do him any good. So, so this, the, the supply chain has to collaborate in order to empower uh, uh, cores uh, to uh, to monetize the, uh, their efforts, which they need to do because they have to buy seeds and fertilizers and all kinds of things to make the and tools to make this all work. So there, there has to be we have to penetrate into the supply chain. And and so far, all of my conversations, you know, with uh, whether that's you know, General Mills or Kellogg or you know, startups that are going into the uh, into the uh, uh, fermented meat products here, I mean, plant-based protein extracts, none of them have the slightest interest to talk about supply chain development, you know, to work with farmers, to assist farmers, because it is inconvenient, it adds cost. They have to decentralize their supply chain, you know, they have to develop different application methods. So, um, yeah, it is a system, and it, you can't you can't pull one lever uh, without having the entire system engage. It's just not going to work at scale. You know, you can do little stuff, but you can't scale it. Thanks, Klaus. Wendy. Yeah, so it's a it's a perfect example, Klaus, and I'm really glad you went into the detail because I don't have the answer for that, right? And I know you're chipping away at it. And I'm, I, I'm sensing that you feel like you're making progress, but the progress is much, much slower than you would like it to be, right? And so it's what's forming in my mind is it almost like, you know, and I know you're not the only one working on it, I, but I feel like if there was a larger effort, more minds put to the task that you just set forth, Right? How could more effort be? How could effort help you? Right? How could maybe maybe a new solution presents itself that that provides easing for your efforts? Right? So if the issues are distribution, transition, and supply chain, um, maybe what comes forward is a new video needs to be created, a new documentary needs to be created, a new presentation needs to be created. More people need to talk to them. Oh, I know someone over here who knows somebody at General Mills. You, it would be better if you talk to that person instead. And then it would affect a whole series. I don't know. I'm making stuff up. Right. But, and it's not that you're not thinking this way. It's that we're not thinking in those ways to help you. 
right? And so I'm not suggesting you need to do anything else. I'm suggesting all of us could add just a little bit more um, to the leading edge of, of frustration and, and need and leading questions that you have. So you, it would be an effort where you're defining what the, what the need is and the leading edge is. And even if it seems like you're, you're doing your thing and you've got it all under control and you've done this a million times before, the rest of the community knowing what that leading edge is might actually have an idea that helps unlock it or helps break it apart or helps move things a little bit faster. Um, and so to me, this is that's the interesting part. What can we do when we start playing in conversation there, putting all our energies towards you. Yeah, that, that's totally, it's clarity of purpose. It's, it's information, education, alignment around common principles. And that's what, that was my reference to World War II, the mobilization, right? Everybody knew we had to build a tank. And it, that tank looked different from a perspective of logistics, supply chain, uh, mechanical engineering, you know, building a, an assembly line, everybody had a different part in this, but they all knew they were working towards a common outcome. And, and we are we are not there yet where we don't, we, we simply don't have that picture of we need to you know, decentralize the food system, uh, uh, bring it as much to community level as possible. We need to have companies change their supply chain strategies, decentralize, develop different aggregation models that support farmers. That's basically the, the, the message. There's an interesting, um, we keep coming, we often come to the example of FDR mobilizing industry to make tanks and whatnot and airplanes, which is, which is fascinating. There's another side of this, which is actually really interesting as well, which is at the end of the war, they had a whole bunch of factories making a bunch of shit we didn't need anymore, like ammunition. And that turned into fertilizers and pesticides because nitrates and all the you know same same chemicals got a lot of them processing we're digging them up we're making them let's just sell everybody a whole bunch of pesticides and it's sort of industrial ag in some sense flourishes after world war ii because these commodities suddenly come on the market and everybody's like let's do that um and that's kind of craziness that happened that really shaped our world tremendously um and and so i say that because there wasn't a there was a demand crisis or, or whatever, because all of a sudden the expenditure of all that ammunition went away and it wasn't like we could stockpile it and it's useless social uh, expenditure, but, but we didn't think to shut down the chemistry and do something completely different. We were like, okay, let's, let's like put it back to work. Um, so I think we need to think creatively about what are the moments where people can see new opportunities and, and shape them differently, like extremely differently. Uh, Julian then Gil. I was going to point out some of this discussion reminds me of the space program of the 60s when America felt that there was a goal to get to. I think the space program is probably a more constructive description than Pearl Harbor. But it's, uh, Klaus was sort of getting to this about the idea of having a goal to work towards. And uh, the other thing I was going to bring up is that um, it, relating to supply chain, the idea is that uh, the people who do well were blessed by God. And if you um, don't make people pay for the waste that they produce, then they get to make even more money. So if a supply chain going to say local farmers costs four cents more, then I would could see that Walmart would not go that way because they lose out on four cents and then they multiply that by a billion. But the thing is part of the structure is going to be getting people to understand that you can't just dump stuff into the air and into the soil and into the rivers because that does cost money. It may not cost the vendor or the manufacturer money, but it's cost somebody money downstream and getting people to understand that they are the ones who are the one, the ones who are losing out on the money. So somebody else can make money. I think this has to be part of the process. Um, about that space race. Um, I have a bit of a pet peeve around it, which is, we collimated a lot of energy and spent a lot of treasure to do that, for which we, a lot of technology spins out of that, but we got some rocks back from the moon uh, and we don't know anything about our oceans. Like nobody spent money to go into the ocean, which is right here on the planet. Don't need to lift anything off the planet. You need to build stuff that'll survive pressure. That's it. There's well, all, all sorts of goodies down there that we, we, we slowly started to figure out like maybe a little piece of it later, but, but we spent 
a lot of money to get off the rock and not a lot to understand the rock. So even that is changing. Uh, the space, the Apollo program was uh, at this back in the 60s, NASA was 4% of GDP. Last time I was at NASA 20 years ago working on the shuttle program, it was 0.4% of GDP. But even back then in 2002, NASA had started to reorient it to a, a lot of Earth sciences. Yeah. And in fact, you look at some of their aircraft, like the U-2 that the military used for spying. NASA had two of those, which they renamed to the ER-1 for Earth resources, ER-1 and ER-2. So NASA already understood that they needed to look back in as well as out. So, and, however, and, with their, their budget has been shrunk so much that they cannot put the same effort that they did back in the 60s. Right. And the other thing is that thanks to George Bush and Sean O'Keefe, this is my personal pet peeve, who ended the two of them who ended the space shuttle program, is that in 2004, they switched NASA from a research agency doing aerospace and technology to an agency to funnel federal money to corporations in red states. And this has also affected their long-term operations. So, yeah, I, I, a lovely side note of the NASA of the space program was the the bases across the South, basically, um, and employment in 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 southern states for a variety of reasons, including favorable geography, um, but also as as sort of a civil rights program in, in different ways. And I, I love the movie Hidden Figures. Um, Gil. Yeah, a few things have been, <laughs> hands have been up for a while, so I got a few things here. Um, there, there's a problem with goals, one of which is that we don't have one. Uh, the other is that um, the goal of, um, you know, beating Japan and eventually Germany in World, World War II is a much simpler goal than the goal of what we have to deal with now. Uh, and so the complexity of the problem, it's not just building tanks that everybody has to align around, but doing, you know, a thousand different things that seem to have no connection with each other. Um, <laughs> It's a challenge for the, um, you know, for the, the command economy strategy, because as you said, Jerry, uh, you know, sometimes the need, what's needed on the ground is not what can be seen from the pinnacles of power. So there's got to be some combination between those. Uh, I'm really, and, you know, and, and there's terrific stuff happening. The, you know, the notion of, uh, of turning parking lots into farms and food forests is great on the one hand. On the other hand, the, prob the food problem is not that we don't have enough food on the planet. It's that it doesn't get to the people who need it and people can't afford it. Um, but, you know, turn parking lots into food forests and you not only provide food, you affect the water regime of cities, you reduce load on sewage treatment plants, you reduce heat, heat island effects, you improve amenities and health and well-being of people. Um, these kinds, you know, these kind of multi-faceted strategies need to be part of the mix. I'm really struck though in this conversation, we're now 75 minutes into the call uh, and I haven't heard any mention of the word power and I haven't heard any mention of the word capitalism. We've talked a bunch about both though. We've talked about politics a whole bunch. We've talked about politics. Early, which is, which is sort of the, the moving around of power, right? Yeah, yeah, but we haven't said the word. Okay, and, and, but now and, we have. And, well, now we have. And, and if, you know, if, if we want to support Doug's notion of command economy, that means someone has to take power to be able to exercise power. And that can be done by, you know, by centralized coup which is you know, the common way we think about it. It could be done grassroots like the Zapatistas or the folks in, in the, what's the name of the community in, in, in uh, the, the, the Kurdish anarchist syndicalist community? Someone knows the name of that. I will look them up, I know. Ro, 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 it's not the Rohingya, it's something else, but, but you've got, you know, you've got a functioning community that's grassroots, democratic, feminist, ecological, military, uh, waging war against their multiple enemies of Turkey and Iraq and so forth. So there are many ways, but you don't get to duck the question of taking power and exercising power. And you don't get to duck the question of, do we have an economy that fetishizes capital over every other form of resource of production? Uh, you know, pet peeve for me, I'd agree with Julian that, you know, how we structure the economics is really key. Not only don't we make people pay for the damage they produce, we subsidize the destruction of life. The whole economic system is built around that subsidy, both, both not paying for the externalities, but also direct payer payments from taxpayers to polluters to generate jobs, you know, GDP and the rest. Uh, so that tangle needs to be a central part of the conversation. Uh, I think you know, a lot of what we've talked about has been wonderful, but peripheral to that. Um, 
And it's tough because, you know, here we are saying climate is the existential crisis. But if we lose the Congress in November, you know, it's all hell to pay. So maybe that's the existential crisis. How do you, how do you, how do you decide and act among multiple existential crises, all clamoring for attention? Totally I'll agree. Stop. Oh, thanks. Um, Stacy. Yeah, so I want to throw out this idea. It's not the best. I mean, I don't know if it's a good idea. I just thought of it, but I want to use it to illustrate something. So when Doug was talking about the land and I was thinking about, you know, the issues that different people would have, I thought to myself, what about if the idea were to find a million different ways, a million different ideas? Because again, I'm thinking about the populace and what feeds them and drives them. Facebook has shown me they like throwing out their ideas. So I thought about my mother who has a large piece of land and she's living in a house like many older people who can't really afford it. She has a fixed income, the taxes are really high. And I imagined if we made a deal with a local landscaping company that they got some sort of stipend for being able to take care of the land that was being farmed and that the homeowner got, you know, got the produce in, in you know, as much as they needed and they got their land taken care of and it became like a community thing. That's just one little idea in one little place that maybe nobody would like, maybe somebody would like, but if we had all of these ideas, which bring, I wanna connect that to the playfulness, the connection and the idea of ideas coming out in conversation, because I've been on a lot of calls where I meet somebody for the first time and they say, well, I feel like I know you because I've watched you. So I wanna share that when people watch us talking, it doesn't mean that they have to be here to still hear the ideas. And I think we should keep that in mind. And I really want to encourage a place where we could all take one person's thing and maybe not do it their way. I mean, I do think that it would be too draconian the way Doug's saying, but I don't have to throw his whole idea out. I can try to think for myself, well, how could I work towards his goal in a way that might work in my little piece? I'm complete. Thanks. Oh, love that, Stacy. Thanks. And I was pointing. There's, there's. I, I don't know how active they are now, but garden dating, yard sharing. There's a bunch of things where you can, in fact, um, have other people farm your land and give you 20% of what they grow or whatever it is. That 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 exists. It's happening uh, in lots of different places. And I don't know if it's petered petered out or or still uh, still growing. Um, Pete, you may have the last word today. Actually, I'm wow. gonna read. I'm gonna read the poem again at the end. So. Um, not quite not, the last. In honor of Cinco de Mayo, but you'll have the last substantive thing to say. Um, I feel like a lot of what we talked about today was incrementalism, uh, which I think isn't going to get us there. Uh, so I really like Doug's plan uh, because it starts small. Um, it it hits a, a, a leverage point and expands from there. So that sounds like something that's not incrementalism to me. Um, uh, I also, Gil's, I, I like Gil's question, you know, amongst, all, you know, a, a number, a handful of existential crises, how do you decide which one to work on? And I think maybe it's, it will end up, if the world changes, it will end up being something else. Um, I think there's going to be a small number of people who find a wedge someplace and they're going to change things. So whether that's the political system or um, the way the Supreme Court treats human rights or climate change or, or water or um, the overarching um, immensity of our, our military. Um, I, I think it's not so much that as one person, you pick the most important problem. I think there are going to be revolutionaries who say, well, this is the thing I'm gonna set out and change uh, today. And I'm gonna gather together, you know, 100, 100 of my closest friends and we're just gonna fricking change the thing. And maybe it'll be climate, maybe it'll be something else, but it won't be incremental if, if, we, need, if we need to get it done in time. Thanks, Pete. Um, this has been a, a wild ride. I really appreciate everybody's hearts and participation in this. Um, I think we're all stirring this in our heads and trying to figure our way toward functional things. Let me reread the poem, which is Cinco de Mayo by Luis Rodriguez in honor of today's Cinco de Mayo. 
Uh, and I just, I'm rereading it partly because it feels more relevant than at the start of the call. It feels like a lot of what we've talked about on this call resonates strongly with the poem. So Cinco de Mayo by Luis Rodriguez. Cinco de Mayo celebrates a burning people whose land is starved of blood, civilizations which are no longer holders of the night. We reconquer with our feet, with our tongues, that dangerous language, saying more of this world than the volumes of textured and controlled words on a page. We are the gentle rage. Our hands hold the stream of the earth, the flowers of dead cities, the green of butterfly wings. Cinco de Mayo is about the barefoot, the untooled, the warriors of want who took on the greatest army Europe ever mustered and won. I once saw a Mexican man stretched across an upturned sidewalk near Chicago's 18th and Bishop, one fifth of May day. He brought up a near empty bottle to the withering sky and yelled out a grito with the words, que viva Cinco de Mayo. And I knew then what it meant, what it meant for barefoot Zapoteca indígenas in the Battle of Puebla, and what it meant for me there on 18th Street among Los Ancianos, the moon-faced children and futureless youth dodging the gunfire and careening battered cars. And it brought me to that war that never ends. The war Cinco de Mayo was a battle of, that I keep fighting, that we keep bleeding for, that war against a servitude that a compa on 18th Street knew all about as he crawled inside a bottle of the meanest Mexican spirits. Um, thank you all. <laughs>